firstly, the clock is starting, so I'm going to be very quick here. Thank you, Christine, for the introduction. Thanks, Rob, for agreeing to team up on this with me. Um, we're going to try really hard to get a lot of content into 20 minutes. So there's definitely things that are going to graze over quickly. Please feel free to contact us afterwards, and uh, we'll try and provide as much information as we can. That is our mandate, to share this and make it as open source as possible. Um, this is the project we're working on. It's been a, a lot of years of work so far, uh, and I'm just going to let you read this and digest this before I move any further. So, part of this project, I get a little, a quick bit of history on it. Um, my partner and I, when we found this property in Guelph, we decided we wanted to purchase it with her family. Uh, it's a multi generational project. We've done a a long kind of study uh, of, of what our family's needs are and what our, our you know, our, her parents' needs are, my parents' needs are, our children. Um, we started this project with one child, we now have three. Things shift, uh, that delayed construction quite a bit. Um, we started to ask a lot of questions very early on, right? We started with, what, how can our home do these things? Now, I'm not gonna hit on all of them some of the time, but enhance our health and well-being. And uh, that's something that uh, Bettina's going to talk about later, which is great. Uh, provide flexible income opportunities. We had to figure out how to afford to do this. We had a tall order of things we want to achieve, and we needed to figure out how we could afford it. Uh, adapt documents changing needs. Be resilient uh, in, in systems. Uh, provide current and future food security, a big one. Uh, food prices, as we all know, going up constantly. Um, help provide um, opportunities for shared family and uh, community ritual. A big part of what our community is, is, is gathering, uh, a place for that. Um, regenerative to local ecologies, biomimicry and biophilic design principles, and shared resources like tonight. Um, this is our team, and I apologize right away, Veda should be up there, Alec and Sarah, I'm sorry about that, I'll make that shift. Um, we have a great team of people involved, this wouldn't be possible without all their input, and. Uh, guidance and uh, just everything about them has been amazing. Um, the strategic planning process, this goes back quite a few years, as I said, this goes probably 12 years now, uh, but really from the property sense, five years. Uh, we started by exploring multiple scenarios. We then populated scenarios with personas. We applied timelines, 50-year human, 100-year built form. We then designed spatial programming to reflect those needs of different generations over that time period. And then we overlay a systems methodology and we see what works, what doesn't, we evaluate. This is a, just a bit of a, a time frame graph over time. So 2013, my family, one child, my partner's parents. Five years from now, we have three kids now, but we're gonna be in this home uh, soon, hopefully. And this is what it could look like for the five years or 10 years after that. The reason we're showing accessibility as a major factor is because we are including a, an accessible, fully universally designed unit in the basement which walks it onto the road. Um, for many reasons, not just for our own personal reasons, but because we believe that there's not enough housing to allow people to age in place properly. It's, it's not, uh, we can't wait for uh, the, the, the structures or the, the governing bodies that are present to, to deal with these issues. Um, we have to do that on our own and lead through building them and, and seeing what happens. Um, we project that down 50 years down the road and as you can see, things shift over time and it's, it's, it's designing spaces that are flexible to adapt um, and adapt in a way that it doesn't involve renovating constantly. Um, breaking down the spatial analysis so we can see that you know from the one on the left here the chart on the left living area is 34 percent for the basement suite it's larger because it is accessible two bedroom uh, the main floor second floor space which is more the fam our family units 57 percent and then nine percent dedicated to an in-law suite um, amenity and support space broken down garage as you can see on the on the right there 43 uh, that's, it's a larger space because it has to incorporate an accessible vehicle, which is larger than a standard vehicle. Uh, winter garden, which is an indoor planting space uh, to transfer over to growth or food production on the rooftop garden in the seasonally. And a biodiversity rooftop, uh, zinc goes here as well. Um, 
So they have a great product that we're going to try and incorporate in this project and a courtyard for the uh, for the rental unit. I wanted to break this down a little bit because this is important to touch on. If you look at all the numbers here, total floor area per person, 10 people, 300 square feet per person. That was our goal. We really wanted to try and hit a number that we could, we could set. And through research, we found that this was a good number. Through actually what, are, what we need, this is a nice number. It works. We don't need more space than that. You know, six people, 1,700 square feet, it, it works fine. I have six people right now in 1,400 square feet. It actually works fine as well. Um, this is the house. Uh, this is showing more the, from the amenity perspective. Uh, the rooftop uh, space where we have food production, the place where we start, the winter garden where we start production and then move it outside, the courtyard down below. Uh, the courtyard being the income property or rental space, um, that actually has a full connection to the backyard. It's really important in living building challenge that it's not just an income property, it is a connection to the site, to the space. It is accessible for everyone to use and everyone to share. This is, uh, I'm gonna go through this really quickly because it's, it's, it's a, a, there's a lot of information out there, but the seven petals are place, water, energy, health and happiness, materials, equity, and beauty. There's 20 imperatives. It's important that when you are trying to achieve the living building challenge, you hit all these targets. We're not sure, we're aiming to hit all of them. There are some very complex areas in there. Um, I'm gonna go through one of each kind of section very quickly. Uh, so for the limits to growth imperative, Number one, three flexible living arrangements in one unit. So that's, that, that meets that target. For net positive water, on-site rainwater, gray water collection, treatment, reuse, we've figured out these systems. Groundwater is still, uh, we're trying to figure out how to reuse groundwater. And the potable water is, is gonna be an issue. We're, we're trying to solve that. Right now it's, it's very complicated, um, especially in the, with the municipal water systems we have in place. And, um, so that one is going to be difficult. We, we may not achieve that, but we're definitely going to go for it. Um, biomimicry planning. We asked a lot of questions in the beginning about how do we do restorative ecosystems for this site. We know we disrupt the, the, the existing ecosystems when we build, every time we build. How do we start to plan for restorative ecosystems before we start construction? How do we know how to do less harm and build these systems back in place after? We didn't have all those answers, so we went out and found someone who did, who has some knowledge in that area, and we brought in Biomimicry Frontiers from Guelph, and they're going to be working on this with us. Um, avoidance of specific ILFI or red listed materials and chemicals. Um, that's something that's really important to this as well. We, we vet every single material that goes into this building. It's a, it's a complicated uh, process, but it's, it's really worth it. A really simple one is PVC, so no PVC allowed. And I, I thought it was simple, I thought I could avoid it, but in our water collection system, there's PVC. So now they're redesigning the entire system to reflect our proposal. Um, our stormwater and our sanitary connections to the city line, the city wants PVC. We're negotiating with them about an alternative. It, it's complicated, but it, it, it can be done. Um, down at the bottom, for equity investment, uh, total project cost, there's a certain percentage of your project you have to donate to charity or to uh, a living equity exchange program. In this case, we are trying to propose that we would do an affordable housing unit for other people, and then maybe that that's the equity. Um, thank you. Um, this is a place, I'm just gonna go through a couple quick examples of how we're trying to achieve this and how we're trying to educate along the way. So this was a restorative ecosystems project we did in the park recently. We went in and basically took a bunch of the different species that were existing on site, uh, trees, and we took that information to the park and we had uh, local youth in the park color all these different pieces for us, paint them, and then we posted them on our, our fence on the site. And the feedback has been great. It's been awesome to get a, everyone in the community started to kind of understand what's happening on this lot, because it's been sitting there for a while. Um, this is something else we believe in. This is the, really trying to explore the the, the area between health and wellness and um, ritual. This is, this is part of our, our exploration and, and we believe in, in not only health and wellness, but ritual as a, as a co core component of, of what my family is trying to do, but also what we're trying to help other people learn. Um, my partner, she's uh, from Scandinavian background uh, and you know, in her family and her grandparents and going all the way back, they've had saunas in every house either inside or outside, and it's, it's part of their 
culture. It is, it is ritual for their family to have saunas at night, but it's also health and wellness. And we are incorporating this in because we believe it's important. So there's other elements of that, the living wall, the yoga wall, the climbing wall. These are all areas that we think are important to include in, in these types of projects. And even if they can't be included right now, they can definitely be roughed in to handle it at a certain point. Um, this is a, a quick kind of take on a, a biomimicry kind of perspective from, from Biomimicry Frontiers. This isn't our project. Um, this is a different project they're working on. And, but it shows that they're, they're exploring uh, different ways to achieve that restorative ecosystems. Quick here, there's different materials we're using. I think the one thing I want to highlight is that certain companies now are becoming more aware of Living Building Challenge. So this Declare label up in the top right corner, that is from Nordic Structures. Nordic is made in, in Quebec. They source uh, black spruce, it's readily available, it uh, you know, grows quickly, and they've gone through the whole process of getting their product declared. So now this product we know we can use in these projects without having to do all the research on it. So a lot more companies are becoming Declare certified. Um, I'm gonna go through equity quickly. Uh, it's a big area to cover in a quick <laughs> overview. Um, it's something really quite unique and, and important in the Living Building Challenge. One of the ways we've tried to look at it is how do we help build these project drivers down here into our programming? How do we plan for different things that make a more equitable space for people? And how do we then share that information? So on the top right, this is a, a workshop we did last year for the Holland School Board. And uh, we planned multi-generational living with a group of uh, a class of students. And it was really amazing because in that project, there was probably 25 students, and I would say 20% of the students, maybe more, all had other family members living in their homes. But it was never designed to accommodate them. And so it's just kind of fascinating how that, how that came about. I think that applies everywhere. Um, there's another overview of the home. And then the last one I want to close down with is, um, what can we do? And so part of that is me being up here tonight. This is what I can do. I can come and present, and I really appreciate your, your time and, and your, your, your uh, entertaining me to, to be up here and share this information. Um, strategic planning and preparation. I can't say that enough. Take more time to prepare and to plan um, before you hit the ground. It's, it's really important. And I'm, I'm, I'm coming up from a builder's perspective. But the, the plans are, there's never enough planning. Um, collaborative work towards developing and implementing innovative solutions. There's a lot of solutions. Promote a sense of agency in our designs. I think we forget that often. Um, support our neighbors when they try and do something unique. Um, and ask yourself, can my home be better utilized as part of the housing solution? Thank you, and I pass this to Rob. Okay, thank you, uh, Gavin, and uh, so the developer of the uh, Living Building Challenge is uh, Jason McLennan, and I met Jason uh, early in my career, about uh, well, 18 years ago, I guess, on the green building side in Vancouver. I was part of the Cascadia Green Building uh, chapter, and uh, we, at that time, we were trying to get LEED into Canada, so it was just starting out. And there was this guy, Jason, on the side saying Living Building Challenge and coming in with this and saying, well, we're trying to figure out daylighting and bike storage and things like this, right? So it was very, very aspirational and uh, we loved it and we said, good luck, uh, but we're going to try this for a while. And, um, but of course, secretly, we all wanted to work on a Living Building Challenge. And it's taken me, you know, 18 years to actually get on one of these projects, which is, uh, thanks, thanks to Gavin. Um, so yeah, a bunch of lead projects, and then into Passive House, and now finally, you know, I feel like I've come full circle. I'm going to talk about the energy paddle. Uh, it covers energy, HVAC, uh, ventilation. Now, in some ways, the uh, Living Building Challenge is very simple. It has very simple uh, thresholds, but it's also very unforgiving. So in this case, you say, okay, you want to do the energy, fine. You've got to do. You've got to create 105 percent of the energy you use in a year using renewable energy on site. So that's the requirement. Now, with that, there are some uh, limitations. They also say you can't do any combustion. No fossil fuels, it's all electric. Uh, 
The exception is that you don't have to cover the electric used for electric vehicles, which is good, because that's quite a, quite a high number. And, um, and, and, and no wood burning as well. So when we say no combustion, no wood burning. Uh, and there's uh, various reasons for why they go that route. There are other, uh, other things that come into this as well. A big part of this is um, monitoring. Uh, the, 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 the whole uh, system is based on actual uh, usage, so you have to have 12 months of consecutive uh, use after commissioning and at full occupancy, and then after that, then you can become uh, certified. So it didn't take much convincing uh, of Gavin uh, that Passive House would be the, uh, the starting point for this project. Uh, in other words, um, it's, the, it's the optimum uh, launch point for net zero or net positive. So, you know, and we chose FIAS because it is a, uh, based on a cost optimization for uh, this specific climate. And uh, some of you might be familiar with that. That's the B opt analysis. So once we got the envelope to Passive House, so we did a number of uh, models. So we looked at windows. Uh, we looked at uh, shading. We looked at uh, wall uh, and slab insulation. All of those things got them, um, got them optimized. And actually, to the point where we actually just got it to Passive House today, tweaking this, tweaking that. Uh, but once we got there, then we turned uh, our attention to the HVAC system. So we have to try to still get our energy down as much as possible. And ventilation is the first one I'm going to talk about here. This covers uh, two aspects. There's imperative six, which is the net zero energy. There's also imperative eight, which is the healthy interior environment. And this is a big part of the living building challenge, uh, linked also with the well uh, building initiative. So we zeroed in on a ventilation, an average ventilation rate in around 0.27 air changes, 0.3, something like that. Uh, 116 CFM, 6.5 air changes per day, which actually sums up to 122,400 cubic feet of air going through that house every day. So a huge amount of air that needs to be conditioned. And so, of course, the first thing we turn and say, well, how can we do that the most efficiently possible? And uh, you know, we turned to uh, high efficiency HRV equipment like this particular brand or others. And we look at it and we say, well, there's the, um, uh, there's the, uh, uh, the uh, renewable, uh, sorry, so the efficiency of 89%, the adjusted uh, sensible uh, efficiency of 89%. We say, well, that's pretty good, you know. But when you actually turn it around and look at it, you say, well, there's 11% that we didn't capture times 122,400 cubic feet per day. That's actually quite a, l a large number. So look, can we do better? So then we looked at these uh, new units that uh, have been around in Europe for quite some time and now are starting to come into North America. We've got this uh, Minotaur unit, the Pentacare uh, V12. It's a compact air treatment unit. It is, uh, uses a heat pump as opposed to a, uh, a core an exchange core. So because it uses a heat pump and the magic of heat pumps means that we can actually achieve uh, an ASRE of 175% at those particular conditions. So 100 CFM at zero degrees Celsius. So what that means is that this thing is actually in, uh, in of, it, of itself is, whoops, is, is, uh, is, is, uh, is, is net zero uh, or is net positive. We're actually producing more energy than we're using. So that's, that's, that's fantastic. Um, but now we're, we're, we're saying, well, okay, but we're still, we're still using all this air. We're still pushing the same amount of air through that building. We're just doing it more efficiently. Can we do something else? So, uh, and, and because we need healthy air, that's a big part of what we're doing. Um, this is what we're seeing in the traditional ERV, where we're seeing, uh, this is VOCs and CO2. And what we're seeing is spikes. Huge spikes, and this is, this could be for any number of reasons. People uh, in the in the house, uh, we're, we're seeing that ASHRAE numbers aren't even enough to really provide enough ventilation, um, and of course VOCs. So maybe I don't know. Maybe they're having a vape party or something. But what what you're seeing here is that 
quite often we're spiking up into the thousands and higher of CO2 and VOCs. And then, of course, down in the bottom, you're seeing that there are occasions when people are away, like for the day, when they've gone, all gone to work, and this ventilator just keeps going, because it's continuous ventilation. It's overventilating. So we're, we're ventilating air when we don't need to. So then we looked at the next unit up, which, in my mind, uh, this unit is uh, getting a little smarter. Build Equinox, the uh, CERV, Conditioning ERV. And this unit looks very much like uh, any other ERV, except it uses a heat pump, just like the Minotaur. But it also monitors VOCs and it monitors CO2. So it is a demand ventilation unit. It only operates when it needs to operate to clear the air off CO2 or VOC. And what you can see here is that the line is much flatter, stays between 600 and 1,000 ppm. And if there are any particular spikes, it deals with it. The, the green uh, parts here, you can just about see the stripes. That's, that's showing where the unit actually shuts down. So it shuts down between periods. It also uh, goes into recirc heating and cooling mode, because all of these things can provide heating and cooling and ventilation. In fact, I, uh, I meant to mention the, um, the previous, wrap it up. So the Minotaur can produce actually as much as uh, 11,000 BTUs uh, per hour of cooling and about uh, 8,000 of, of heating. The, the build, uh, Equinox serve is a little less. Now, uh, one of the things that, that this also has is that it's Wi-Fi connected. It provides uh, information on uh, monitoring, on VOC levels, real-time information, but also historical data analysis. It also has, um, it also is, is connected through the Wi-Fi for software don't downloads, much like Tesla. And so you know that you're getting an approved product as time goes on because uh, Build Equinox also stores all this information to improve the product and then you know, keep making the, the product better. This is a, 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 key, a key graph um, that's gone all wonky, but basically this line shows how much uh, heat these things can produce. And of course with a heat pump, what happens is that as the temperature goes down, you produce uh, less heat. Your, your coefficient performance goes down and you can't produce heat. And about a minus 11, you know, both the Minotaur and, and the conditioning ERV will crap out, okay? They'll still keep ventilating, but they won't provide any heating and cooling. So what happens at that point? Well, now we, now we start to think about, well, how can we help this unit carry on so that we don't have to, we can either put heat after the unit or we can put heat before the unit to, uh, to help, it, uh, uh, help it work in an efficient way. So we've talked about uh, an earth tube going upstream of the unit, and this, is, this happens to be a project uh, that I did in Huron County. It's just getting commissioned. Uh, this is the earth tube inlet. An earth tube is exactly what it sounds like, a tube that goes under the earth six feet down where the earth stays pretty much constant temperature. The air is preconditioned as it comes into the house. It's pre-cooled in the summer. It's preheated in the, in the winter. Uh, in the summer, we also drop out moisture. I know. Um, so that's one way we can actually precondition. We can keep the, what, the, what the ERV, what the uh, heat pump ERV is seeing is much milder conditions. So it, it, won't, uh, it, it can operate better. The other thing we're looking to do is uh, use a hot water, because hot water, is, of course, is an important thing. But I'll just mention that we're actually looking to use the sand and hot water heater, not only as a hot water heater, but also uh, to provide heat for a coil to help the minute, uh, help the uh, serve, okay? The interesting thing, I'll tell one last, one last thing, I, I promise. One last thing about this little innovation here is that usually the outdoor unit, this one, which is the evaporator, is uh, left outside, outdoors. Because one of the problems if you put it inside is that it actually sucks heat out of your house during the summer. So we're gonna put it outside. But what we're gonna do, because it only weighs 100 pounds, and, and the thing is it's connected by water lines. So we're gonna put quick, quick disconnects on this thing so that we can bring that inside in the summer and, um, and get free cooling. Yeah, so anyway, uh, this is our passive house. Uh, this was just literally hot off the press. Yuri here did some modeling for us and got it down to passive house, except for heating load. I don't know anybody here who can get uh, uh, passive house uh, or FIAS heating loads. I can't seem to get it, but we got everything else. So we're pretty happy about that. And um, yeah, that's the energy strategy in a nutshell.